thanks for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I want to give a big shout out to the JP Forum. They're a really great group of people. Um, uh, I'm really honored that, um, that they invited me here and, um, and that they're doing this forum. Just, just a quick history um, as to how we got to today. Um, some of you know um, that uh, I was in, in Paris at the, the COP21 um, representing soil for climate and um, <clears throat> and then and Quentin was there and we were texting each other like he was in the the blue zone he was in the blue zone and I was in the green zone there was literally just a wall between us but a lot of security between that wall but anyway um, um, then I came back and then I wrote on the 350 list about soils because the language of soils had finally gotten into the the uh, you know, into into the in, in, into the um, accords, but but it was like voluntary. You know, it wasn't. It, it was uh, kind of penciled on the side, but it, but 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 there was some language there, and I, re I reported about that on the 350 list. Um, and then John um, is here somewhere. Uh, John wrote me. He said, "Hey, you know, I think that would be a great talk for the JP Forum." And um, so that's how it happened. And then they said, "Seth, when can you come and talk about?" Um, soils, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in building a movement. You know, I give lots of talks. I really want to see change. And so the, the whole point of, of my objective has been to make this conversation part of the climate movement. Um, and so I said, let's get Quentin, because I knew Quentin, I knew he would represent sort of, if you will, the mainstream climate side of things or the emissions reduction side of things. Um, and and let's do it together. Let's show that this is all one conversation. That is the, the reduction of emissions and the expanding of the sequestration potential is all part of, of the message. And, and that's really my goal, if you will. If I had 30 seconds to talk, I would say um, there is hope for the future because in addition to cutting emissions, um, we can also expand the sink, if you will, or the drawdown capacity. And, and um, th that's really sort of like the main point. And, and those two things, they just need to be coupled together. And so whenever people are talking about climate, they need to say, yes, we need to cut emissions and we need to expand sinks or biological sinks. Those two have to be together. You can't just say one without the other. It, it won't work. And, and that's why we wanted to uh, in invite Dr. Yarmoff here today uh, representing France because France is the first state the, the, the four per thousand or four per one thousand or um, four per mil, um, as they say it there, is the first state-sponsored program specifically calling for, for voluntary uh, targets of soil carbon as a climate change goal. I mean, that is the specific stated objective. And if you go to 4p1000.org, four, four I know you all have your smartphones, but you've turned them off. Um, you know, you'll see it right now. I mean, they say very specifically, this is a climate change goal uh, by, by asking countries to increase their soil carbon. So I just thought that was great, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, helping to further spread that idea, because someone had to go first, and, 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 and France was hosting COP21, and they went first. So, um, so that's very exciting. Now, um, my talk is um, just going to sort of expand upon the potential of soil and um, why it's important for climate and what are some of the drawdown possibilities you know, through, through photosynthesis, basically, and how that's helpful for us to think about the future. Now look, I know I have way more slides than we're going to be able to realistically get to, um, so, but they're already in the system, so I can't avoid them. But, um, <laughs> But, but we'll just go quickly. And um, so <clears throat> the idea here, when I first put up this logo, well, s most people kind of got it. But someone said, why do you want to put dirt in the sky? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, OK, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> um, but, you know, what, but it is interesting. What you're trying to do is you're trying to bring sort of dirt or carbon that's in the sky back, back down. OK, so let's just go to the next slide. And the idea here is just to think holistically or to, to realize that the, the climate is a function of biology and of oceans and of, and, and of lots of things um, 
not just you know emissions that, that we put out there. And if we learn to work, if we learn to work with nature, um, it will turn out to be our biggest ally in in in, in solving the climate uh, problem. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so again, I'm just going to go quickly, but it's just sort of obvious when you look at a picture like this. You, you see how the moisture in the air and the trees, it's all part of one thing. And that's what I mean about being separately. It's not like there's moisture and there's trees. No, there's a, a system where the trees make the moisture and the moisture helps the trees and, and the soil is all part of that as well. Um, I, you know, I'll go like that and that'll be next slide. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, just, I just love this picture, but so, this shows you the root systems, and this is perennial grasses. This is what the U.S. Uh, prairie used to look like. And um, so the other slide that you just saw, think about, well, that's like above ground, right? That's the trees and the mist. Well, there's this entire universe of moisture and life and carbon um, that's underground. And you know, the point I'm going to make is that this is really this is really where the ball game is being played, so to speak, in terms of carbon capture in the terrestrial ecosystem. It's in the soil, a, a vast majority of all carbon um, that is in, in the terrestrial ecosystem is in soils. It's actually not in trees or vegetation. You, you tend to think, oh, it's in the tree. Well, it's actually in the soil under the tree. And um, this, this, gives, this picture is so amazing because it really, uh, this was an exhibit at the, um, at the, uh, at the um, U.S. Um, B B Botanical Society. Um, it actually, it actually just went, just stopped recently. But, but um, the the reason why soil is dark is because that's carbon compounds. Like that's why it's dark. And so you're literally looking at carbon. And where did that carbon come from? It came from the atmosphere. Like that's the only place it did come from. Um, you know, it didn't come from somewhere else. It came from the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. And um, so you know, when I pick up a handful of dirt, I, I sometimes say a fistful of mitigation. You know, and you, you think of those, those old um, movies, um, Clint Eastwood movies. Remember, um, a fistful, of, <laughs> fistful of dollars, whatever. So a fistful of mitigation. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and then this just basically shows uh, the carbon cycle. Um, and again, you know, we, we really don't have time. And you can go back and find these types of things online and we can talk about it more. But kind of the, the point of this, obviously there are cycles, but the point is in the bottom left, you see where it says soil 2300? So these are gigatons or billions of tons of carbon. Okay, so that's, that's, that's um, 2300 billion. So that, that's, that's technically 2.3 teraton. Anyway, it's a lot, okay? And, but, but the point is, if you look at plant mass, you see it's 550. So there, there's almost four times more, or, or there is four times more carbon in soil than at all plant biomass, including all trees. So that's kind of the point that I, that I wanted to make. This slide, actually it recaps the other slide, but in a little more condensed way, because the other slide was about fluxes. This is also fluxes, but what this is showing here is that where it says 8.9, so that's 8.9 gigatons of carbon per year that are emitted through emissions. And then these are the sinks that it goes into. Now, of those sinks, two are damaging, right? The atmosphere and the oceans. But ironically, the sink into soil is a good thing. You want the carbon to go into the soil. And so in many ways, again, if the, if the presentation had to end right now, I would say just look at the left arrow where it's going into the soil, the 2.6. The goal of what we're working on, soil for climate, is to expand that sink. And the goal of what emissions reductions and divestment and mothers out front and Cambridge Action, uh, Climate Action Business Association and, um, and you know, 350.org and the mostly the entire climate movement is on reducing the 8.9. And, and so you see, eventually, the, the sink has to be bigger than the source. It has to be, or we don't have a future, right? That part has to get bigger than that part. And so we have to do both. 
you have to cut emissions. So the 8.9, it literally has to come down to nothing. We need to be a carbon neutral society. And, and the 2.6 needs to be much bigger as well. It needs to be bigger than the source because there's already too much carbon in the atmosphere. We can't just say, okay, well, we're done. Well, we'll stop admitting. It's like, no, that, that's not even good enough. There's already latent warmings that are in the process. So we literally need to go the other way. And the only way to do that is with extensive photosynthesis. And then, oh, sorry, go, go to the, the next slide. And the, the point of this slide is just to show how big the sink potential is in soil. That, in, that is, in terms of what needs to be done, soil can handle it. We just need to manage for it. That's like the seminar. The, the point here is just to show that the carbon sink is huge compared to the legacy carbon that's in the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, but you see, there there's a problem, and and this is also really important for people to, to understand. And um, uh, this is from Susan uh, Solomon. Uh, she, she was with the National Oceanographic and uh, Air Administration at the time uh, when this paper came out. But this paper was really sort of a, a, a seminal paper. It came out in 2009. It says, irreversible climate change due to carbon dioxide emissions. This paper shows that the climate change that takes place due to increases in carbon dioxide concentration is largely irreversible for 1,000 years after the emissions stop. And she didn't say any unless, okay, that's 2009, we'll get to that. But this is from her paper in 2009, and uh, the point that she makes in the, oops, uh, next slide, yeah. Yeah, so the point that she makes in the, in the top left diagram there um, is that even if you stop admissions, and that there's different levels here for where you stop at, 450 parts per million, 550, 650, going up to 1,200, it doesn't just come down. It stays there for a long time. And then underneath that is the surface warming. And then to the left of that is the thermal expansion of the oceans. Notice that the oceans continue to expand because of, of what's called deep uh, warming. And Tom Garot is here, can, can tell you more about that. This is for a thousand, and it doesn't just stop at 1,000 years. I mean, it, they just stop doing the modeling after 1,000 years, OK? This is, this is a serious problem. Um, and that's why you have to have drawdown, because even stopping doesn't solve the problem. Even if we went to admissions tomorrow, we're, we're still cooked. We need to improve the sinks. Now, so that paper was 2000, sorry, next slide, was 2009. This is IPCC. 2013, so this is four years later from the IPCC. A large fraction of anthropogenic climate change resulting from CO2 emissions is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial time scale, except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere over a sustained period. Okay, anyone want to venture a guess what that large, what's going to be the source of that large net removal? Say it. Soils. Exactly. Now, what's interesting in this IPCC paper is that they don't, they don't specifically say what it is. They just say, well, we're screwed unless like a miracle happens. And that large net removal, that's the official language in the IPCC now. Okay? Now, this just went by most people and most climate activist people, you know, just went over. But we need to pay attention to that now, and that's the point of this meeting, is to get you to understand that soil is that sink. And um, here's just a typical cross-section of, um, of soil. You see what they call the different horizons, and uh, there's, there's the, the top horizon, then there's what they call the mineral layo, uh, layers, but, you know, clay or silt, whatever the type of soil it is, but, but the top layers are, are where you see the carbon. I mean, you literally see it, okay? I mean, that's why pencils are dark, graphite. You know, that's why coal is the color of coal. Um, so let's, let's go on to the next, I'll just go like this. And so how does it work? It works through photosynthesis, um, uh, through 
plants, the, the leaves that, that conduct photosynthesis, they then emit through their roots what are called exudates. Um, they're chemicals that come through the roots. They're carbon compounds of a million different types. Um, and they feed what's called the, the soil food web. Um, and then, oh, so here, here's the, the, the mycorrhizal, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fungal, the fungal networks are essential to all this. Again, I mean, any one of these slides we could talk about forever, but, but we'll, we'll just need to go on. You, you get the idea. And then here's sort of a close up um, of, of what's going on around the uh, mycorrhizal. This is something called glomulin. It, it's just a, a, a new, like it was only recently discovered. And they think that something like 30% of the carbon in the soil could be unglomulant. So they just keep discovering more and more about this underground universe. And um, oh, so then, so those, here's a, here's a quote from a, a paper. Root exudates clearly represent a significant carbon cost to the plant. The ability to secrete a vast array of compounds into the rhizosphere is one of the most remarkable metabolic functions of plant roots, with nearly 5 to 21% of all photosynthetically fixed carbon being transferred to the rhizosphere through root exudates. And I've heard numbers as high as 50%. This is actually sort of an old paper. So the, the plant is giving away a large fraction of all of its photosynth photosynthetically fixed carbon. It's literally giving it away. Why is it giving it away? It's feeding the ecosystem around it that supports it. So that's the biology of, of what happens in the plant roots. From, from a climate point of view, that's how the carbon's getting in the ground. Um, and again, this, it feeds the soil food web. Obviously, we could go talk about this slide for a long time. But there's, there's more like it. What, what I like about this one is this one pulls out a little more, and it gives you more of a larger view, a typical sort of prairie. Um, but what I really like about this is you see the rain in the distance. And, and you get the sense that if it rains, you know it's going into the soil. The moisture is going into the soil, right? It's not going to run off. And that's what I really like about this slide. Um, and then, again, I wasn't supposed to put up numbers, but just really quick, what's happening here is that these are different ecosystems going across like this with the areas. But then look at this section on the right where it's called global carbon stocks. The first column is vegetation. So that's the carbon in the vegetation in that ecosystem. But the next column is carbon in the soil. Look at the relationship between the carbon that's in the vegetation above ground versus the carbon that's in the soil in that particular ecosystem. What I want you to see is just the comparison between the carbon that's like in croplands in the vegetation part versus what's in the soil. See, this is the point of this slide. And even in a tropical forest where there's barely no soil at all, there's still more carbon in the soil than there is in the vegetation. That's, that's the point of that slide. OK, let's go on. Um, so obviously, um, uh, soil is being, has been degraded really for thousands of years. I mean, long before commercial modern agriculture. Humans have been degrading ecosystems, and carbon has been lost from soils. Uh, this picture was taken from the 1950s from, um, from East Texas, sorry, West Texas, this, uh, Roosevelt County. And um, you can see that's four feet of soil loss. Well, how much carbon is that? It's a lot, right? And this plant, this is what they call Texas blue stem. Remember this, because you're going to see it a relative of it again. The scientific name for it is um, heteropogon girardi. Sorry, andropogon girardi. But remember this because you're going to see it again, or you're going to see a relative of it again. How was this grass possible? It was possible because there were tens of millions of ruminants, buffalo and other prairie animals. And but not just the animal. It was the entire ecosystem. It was the predators that moved the animals and the, and the, and the 
the burrowing creatures, but basically the biological digestion of the cellulose in those plants was being done by the megafauna. So I'm throwing out some terms now. Get to know megafauna, okay? That's an important term. Large, large animals are essential to maintaining grassland health, which is essential to maintaining deep carbon stores, which is essential to regulating the climate. Okay, so that's a point that anyone knows, who knows me is gonna know. Megafauna are, your, megafauna are your friend, okay? Including livestock managed properly. We'll get to that. Okay, let's, let's go on. Um, so the, the point of this slide, um, I know, I wonder if this is one of those slides we should just jump past, but, but what's going on here is, this is, this part here is zero. So this is a drawdown, and everything above it is an emission. And what what's that's telling you is that forests are a source of drawdown, but everything above is emission. And look at the, the first orangey one. It says net forest conversion. So when you, when you log, you're taking away part of the sink, and you're turning it into a, in a source. It's exactly the wrong thing to do. So logging, destroying forests, is the complete opposite of what we need to do. We need the sinks to get bigger and the admissions to go down. That's the point of that slide. Um, so how are we going to how are we going to do, do this? Well, obviously through better agricultural and land management practices, organics uh, that doesn't use uh, pesticides. Um, that, that, dis, that destroy the, f the, the food web. Th th that's the thing, that the pesticides and the fertilizers, they destroy that web. Sometimes th th they give the plant the quick fix of, of uh, like nitrogen, potassium that it needs, but, but normally it would have gotten it through a whole community of interactions, right? And so when you sidestep that community of interactions, it, it, it dies. The, the sort of the soil life dies, and then it becomes addicted like, like a drug addict you know, on that, on that fix because it's not in the soil anymore. Well, anyway, um, organics is one way to help get better uh, soil quality and soil carbon. And um, uh, uh, no-till is a very important methodology now. Um, uh, this is something called green planting where, where they, they actually are planting the cover crop right on top or the winter crop right on top of of, uh, of the previous crop. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Oh, and then this is what Quinton and Cannon were talking about. So this is an, ur an urban area, right? So you can, you can do stuff locally. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't, we didn't go ahead. I'm not, I'm not quite in sync. Uh, so I'm on the next slide. So this is, this is the uh, biochar. Um, uh, biochar is becoming a new topic, very exciting. It, it's, a, it's a form of high temperature, low oxygen um, um, burning of, of biomass, and you're left with, it, with a type of charcoal, but, but it, it's, like, it's like almost all carbon. And so at, normally if, if a, a tree dies, it oxidizes. It's part of what's called the transient cycle or the, the short carbon cycle. It just goes back into the air again. Um, but, but this keeps it, it keeps it there. And this becomes a really good additive for soil. And um, I just want to give a shout out right now. Uh, Tom, would you mind standing up? Everybody, this is Dr. Tom Garo, the world's leading biochar expert. I just, <laughs> I, just, I just happen to have him with me. Remember the, remember the Woody Allen movie where uh, Marshall McLuhan, he says, I just happen to have. And um, uh, Tom is the editor of this book that just came out called Geotherapy. Uh, innovative methods of soil fertility restoration, carbon sequestration, and reversing CO2 increases. So, Tom, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, I'll just go through the, the biochar slides quickly. This is biochar mixed with mulch. This is um, sort of a, a, a close up of. Um, uh, of, of the cellular structure inside biochar. And, and this is why it's so great um, for soil, is because it creates these habitats for, for, for life. And it's been called akin to a coral reef, 
why, but for the soil, which I thought is a very interesting way of thinking about it. Um, this is the, um, um, the, the, the terra preta soils in the Amazon. Uh, do people know about this? Have people heard about this? Um, they, dis they discovered it recently. These are, these are man-made soils or human-made soils that are, that are the, the, the result of basically they were creating biochar 2,000 years ago. Um, and they think that actually the area supported much higher population densities than they thought was possible because of this biochar. And the way, what they basically did, they think, is they just created these ditches. They put trash, if you will, or uh, other biomass, like um, you know, the, the stalks of, of plants that they were harvesting, and they lit them on fire, right? But then they covered it, right? And so it was like in this low oxygen smolder, if you will. And, and they discovered that they could do that. And that lo and behold, they had the most amazing soil. And the scientists are blown away to discover this now. This is all over uh, in the Amazon. And the, they think it must be 2,000 years old. Um, next, next slide. And then here's, here's what the terra preta looks like. But this is normal rainforest soil on the right. It, the rainforest soils are the worst. It, it's sort of interesting the way it works. The wetter the environment, the lesser the, the quality of the soil. It's kind of an opposite. That's because you can have more biomass ab above ground to take in the moisture. You see, having, having a deep soil is a way of conserving water. And that's why the low, ra low rainfall areas have such deep soil is because that's how they conserve, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting strategy. But anyway, look, look, at, the, look at the difference. It's profound. Um, and then, and then here's, here's the regions. Um, they call it high density anthropogenic soils, or terra preta, or biochar. It's a 2,000 year old invention. And, and now they're realizing that, that they can do it, uh, that they can do it now. Um, yeah, let's go on to the next slide. Um, Can we wrap up in a couple of minutes so we have time for questions? Okay, well, it's Chuck's fault. <laughs> okay, all right, well, then at that point, um, th there, are, there are many other excellent methods. Uh, adaptive multigrazing is one. This is, this is just a way in which you move animals in a way that replicates the, um, the, uh, the wild ruminants that, that were on the prairie. Um, let me just say goodbye to Dr. Yarmouth for you leaving. Okay, goodbye. Thank you so much for yeah, coming. So yeah, much. okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's just let's just go to the go to the um, so this is a way of moving livestock that represents that that mimics um, uh, ruminants. And uh, this slide just shows um, Sorry, the, the evolution of how ruminants and deep soils co-evolve together and why that's so important. Um, you know, what I've been trying to do, what we're trying to do is create a meme now. Okay, so that was some of the science. So now this is like the activism part of it. And so this was me at the Africa Center for Holistic Management in Zimbabwe in 2011, I think. And when Bill McKibben was having the, 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 the step it up, or the, the day of actions. And so we did a day of action there. And the whole point of why I went there was to learn how to do restorative grazing and livestock management. So, so I was saying, that, look, this is a climate solution. But at the time, I was just thinking, well, we want to be in solidarity with 350. So there we were. Um, so let's just go on. So, but then recently, um, we've taken on soil as a meme itself. And soil for climate is the organization. And then uh, we heard a quote from uh, Vandana Shiva earlier, which was quite wonderful. That's her in the bottom left there holding our sign, and that was um, at Paris. And there's um, Hunter Lovins in the, the top left. She wrote the book Natural Capitalism with Paul Hawken. And uh, oh, look at that. There's Tom Garreau right there. There's half of him. Um, okay, let's just, let's just go quickly through here. But that was in Paris. But anyway, the point is, it is becoming a movement now, and it's all over the world. Um, and it's just very exciting to, uh, to, to see it. And who's that guy? Photo, photo bomb, huh? 
The, the, the truth is this picture's in focus, we're just blurry. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's go on. And then, and getting the youth involved, getting the next generation, because, you know, they love it. And, um, yeah, we could just keep going. So this was just at this last Earth.